HorsePlayerNow.com's Joe Christovec joined by Kate and Bradar for another video episode of Horse Racing Night School. And on this edition, we're going to talk all about the trainer. And Kate, the trainer is a coach, a nutritionist, a manager, a promoter, so to speak, also an organizer, and sometimes even a psychologist. A lot of different aspects of the job, and we're going to explore all of those today. Yeah, don't forget businessman, but at heart, trainer is a horseman. And the most important job they have is to figure out how to get the very most out of whatever type of horse that they have. And it's amazing to see the differences in styles and techniques and uh, the people who are able to balance it so well. And it's an individual sport because the horses run in individual races, but as far as the trainer is concerned, it's also a team sport because collectively they want to see their whole barn do well. There's a lot to explore. What do you say we get started? It sounds good to me. It's a game of details and uh, nobody knows it more so than the Eclipse award-winning trainer, Dale Romans, who grew up in the game. Dale, you, your father was a trainer. You saw it firsthand. You lived in a state that kind of idolizes horse racing and the sport and the Kentucky Derby in Louisville, but was there ever a time in your life when you didn't think you'd be a trainer? I, I can't remember one. You're right, in Kentucky there's basketball and there's horse racing and I couldn't jump very high, so I stuck with uh, horse racing. And, I mean, there was 30 days there I bust tables at a restaurant and that's confirmed that I wanted to be a horse trainer. A lot of people would think it's more work though, uh, busting tables, but we know how much work goes into to horse racing. Talk a little about kind of the various jobs and how you work your way up to get to the point of being a trainer, what you have to it, know. It's not really as much work as just a lifestyle. I mean, it's just part of your life. You go to work, you go to the barn every day. I don't even think about going to work. It's just somewhere you have to be. But, you know, I was fortunate enough to be born into a racing family, so I would go to the barn every day since I was a kid. So I started walking horses when, you know, I was eight or nine years old. I ran my first horse at Churchill Downs as a groom when I was 12. And uh, I don't think you can do that anymore. You're probably getting jailed for some of the stuff we had to do as kids working around the barn. But so the entry was easy for me. But then you see a lot of people from the outside that ask, how do I get started? What, what do I do? And, and I tell them that basically, if there's a barn in your neighborhood or if there's a barn in your community somewhere, go out and start working in it. Get familiar with just being around a racehorse, and then you can move to the racetrack. You see a ton of people come from, uh, the, especially the exercise riders, come from where they were event people when they were kids and their family had horses, and, and, and they just transfer their skills over and learn about thoroughbreds. Uh, Dale, Kate mentioned horsemanship being the most important aspect of your job, but we also talked about a lot of the other aspects of what you do day in and day out. First of all, what's your favorite part of being a horse trainer, and what's your least favorite part? Well, I think my favorite part's the... Uh, is buying the young horses and de trying to develop a young horse and seeing them move forward every day and the horses that continue to get better. And, and the least favorite part is, is it's a game of disappointments. I mean, there's a lot of disappointments. Horse horses get injured and you just still, I don't care how long you're in the game, it, it's just, it, it really hurts when a horse, especially if they're catastrophically injured, and then you get to second guessing yourself. Should I have taken them on the track this day? What I could have done different? Or, and it hadn't changed in, in, in 30 years of being around the racetrack. But, uh, that's, that's the worst part of it, and I think that's the biggest thing that we can do for the game right now is keep working to figure out how to reduce the catastrophic injury rate. You talk about uh, developing a young horse as being one of the thrills, one of the best parts of the game, but you've also developed an entire operation, and the stable that you have now, particularly last year with what has to be a career best season, um, is very different from the type of uh, operation that you were in when you first got started. What did it take to kind of get to this point? You know, I took a lot of steps along the way. I mean, I started with just the bottom level claiming horses, and if you go to my dad's stable, that's all we had, basically. I think he only won a handful of stakes in his whole career, but, but it paid the bills, and a lot of people were around like that, and I always wanted to take it to the next level. Um, my father always said he never did because he didn't want the pressure of a good horse. He didn't want to, he couldn't handle it if one got hurt that was a really top horse. But I always wanted to train the best. And I, growing up as a kid, I mean, my heroes were Charlie Whittingham and Alan Jerkins and those types of guys, not baseball or basketball players. And I thought I always want to be like them. And, um, and so, we, you know, like at, Wayne Lucas told me early in my career, you have to earn the right to train the horses he was training at the time. And so hopefully I've earned the right. I mean, we've, we've stepped along. We had, I had cheap claimers and we got the higher claimers and we got the, you know, some solid horses. And then last year I got to train some truly elite horses. Yeah, let's talk about the other side of the game where maybe you have a client that paid a lot of money for a horse. You get that horse back to the barn. You've been training the horse. They're not showing you a whole heck of a lot in the morning. At what point do you have the conversation with the owners and say, you know, we need to do right by the horse. We need to put them in a 
place where they can potentially succeed. That's got to be a disappointing phone call to have to make, but you do have a job to do, and that's to maximize the talent of the horse and put them where they can win. It is, but I mean, if we, if we have a, a very a really expensive yearling, say that, that they just can't run. I mean, it happens all the time. Um, but I like to give them at least one or two shots, and then we'll figure out they, they've got to take the drop because if they're a colt, they're only worth what they can earn. And, and you know, if it's a filly, sometimes you'll go ahead and retire them and make them a broodmare. They, their genetic profile still strong. They just don't have the talent themselves, and they can go on and be good producers. But especially a colt, you just, uh, I mean, it's tough, but you know that going in. that. Uh, but that's, you know, I tell everybody, when you put your money in, just count it gone. If we get it back, then that's great. And so don't put your, your, your investment money for the future. Just put your fun money in the game. How cognizant are you when, when you're running horses and when you're placing horses of um, kind of where they fit in that particular spot and, and what type of a price they're going to be? And, and do you actually watch the odds board and, and do you feel anything one way or the other when you see you've either got a short priced favorite or say you look up and the horse is 20 to 1? No, I don't pay a lot of attention to the odds. I mean, if I did, I wouldn't have run in the Breeders' Cup mile last year or the Breeders' Cup class or turf this year. But, you know, if I feel like my horse is doing well, I think I know where they belong most of the time. And even if they're losing, it, sometimes you're doing things to get them to step forward for later on. And you you know maybe you're not running the best horse. You hope that things go right and that they get a, a trip, the dream trip, and they go ahead and win. But even every race has a purpose. Is it harder to train the better horses, or is it harder to train the horses that have lesser talent? Well, it's harder to train the horses with lesser talent. It's harder to train the owners of the good horses. <laughs> they, uh, as soon as you get a good one, I mean, you start getting a lot of help. And, and I would imagine managing the owners is, is as big a part of the job now as, as managing the horses. It's a, it's a huge part of the job. I'm fortunate I have great owners uh, that I work with, and I've kind of made it that way. I don't want to, like I said in my acceptance speech and what Alan Jerkins told me, it, it takes good horses and good owners to make a good trainer. You can have a good horse and a bad owner, you won't do any good because they just are keeping you in the wrong places and pressuring you to do things you don't want to do. I don't have that right now. I have a lot of guys that are uh, into the game, they enjoy the game, and they we talk every day, and they're a big part of what's going on. And but they, at the end of the day, they let me make my decisions. I think in my course of time working in horse racing, Dale, I've seen a lot of great training accomplishments and feats. But you look at a horse like Little Mike, who a lot of people, the so-called experts, the handicappers, look at this horse as a speed mile horse. You got him to win the Arlington Million on the lead, going a mile and a quarter, and that still didn't make believers out of most of the general public. When he goes into the Breeders' Cup turf, he's a huge price. He sits behind horses and he wins again. Did you know all along that this horse had the stamina to win these kinds of races or be at least competitive in these kinds of races? Because most of the betting public didn't know. I thought he did because it's a very rare horse, Little Mike. It's one of those that just goes and keeps on going. Even when he's running his miles, you watch him gallop out, he just they can't pull him up. And I figured if you change the pace scenario at a longer race and he could gallop along, at a lot slower fractions than he was in these mile races, and he could just keep right on doing that all day long. And he's a tough horse to run against because if you go after him, you're sacrificing yourself. But if you leave him alone, he's going to out gallop you. And um, the, the toughest decision was in the, the Breeders' Cup was to take back. But when we handicapped the night before, it didn't seem like there was any way possible anybody could go wire to wire to me. I thought that uh, Todd's horse was going to run out of there for sure and then there was a couple others that looked like they had to sprint away so when we talked to Ramon about it I said just get him in that rhythm it doesn't matter where he's laying and hopefully they're just going to stop in front of him he'll inherit the lead and keep on going and that's exactly what happened and it was a great job by Ramon to get him to do that but he's one of those horses that would just do whatever you, he will do whatever you want him to do could you tell that in his training like oh yeah he's, you can tell he's a smart smart horse you know if I want him to gallop fast he gallops fast you want him to gallop slow he gallops slow you want him to work fast he does slow it doesn't make any difference he'll do whatever you he takes all his cues as he's supposed to talk about a different type of horse in a lot of different ways uh, but equally talented Shackelford a uh, horse with a lot of energy uh, showed a lot of promise early on and then gradually seemed to put it together he's a super horse I mean he's a life-changing type of horse uh, to win the Preakness with him and get my first classic win and he was just a phenomenal athlete. I mean, he was a big, strong, but but still just light on his feet, easy mover. Everything he did came, everything came easy to him. And um, I don't know, he's hard to describe. He's, he's one of the best horses I've ever been around, one of the smartest. You know, he knows, he knew he was a celebrity. He knew the Preakness. So it had to be a thousand people come and pet him the night after the Preakness. He had a big party at the 
barn after the Preakness. One of the best events in horse racing and underrated, I think, is the Preakness. And they have a huge party at the barn. And, and usually you rope them off, but few people came and let them pet him, and he liked it. I just let them all come. And there, before the night was over, he had to have a 1,000 visitors. And he knew he was a star. He stood there and shook hands with every one of them. Did you know all along when you first had him in your barn that he was maybe a, a cut above or going to be special? Yeah, I was at Saratoga when he came to the barn, and I called home one day to see how everybody was doing it. Tammy said, I think it was the first time she breezed him. She, she said, I think you have a special horse here in the forestry. Well, and I've had disappointments with a lot of forestry, so I didn't let myself get too excited about it. And uh, when I came back from Saratoga and we started breezing him, he was showing some real promise, and he got a little sick on us. We had to see him to the clinic, and he missed some time, and I didn't get him started as early as I wanted to. We ran him at Keeneland on the poly, and I don't like starting my young horses out there if I don't have to, but we did. He ran horrible. So then I just thought, well, it might be another forestry that just uh, shows promise but isn't going to fulfill it. But then the next time out at Churchill, he ran a game race and just steadily improved. And, he, and then he threw another clunker here in the Fountain of Youth, and we had a scratch in our head, and he was just training so good. The big decision of his whole career and, and, and mine was to run him back in the Florida Derby at 67 to 1. You talk about avoid, not worrying about the odds. He was just training too well, and I thought he needs one more chance to be a, a classic horse. We threw him in there, and he gets beat ahead to dialed in. I mean, it, it was such a tough decision. I didn't make it to the last minute. And I think back now how little things like that make a huge difference and what, what his career would have been like if I'd duck and take the easiest path and not running back in the Florida Derby. Yeah, when you talk about Shackleford being a horse that you thought had talent, but he kind of surprised you for a lot of different reasons and went on to have a great career. How frustrating is it to have a horse in your barn that's really well bred that you can see has talent in the mornings and for whatever reason you just can't seem to unlock what that horse can do best? How frustrating can that be from a trainer's perspective? That's the worst. I mean, you get a horse that you think has enough talent and whether they're just not competitive or whether they just they, they get a little intimidated or something, you know they have it in them, they just don't, you just can't get it out. It's the worst thing for a horse trainer to have to deal with. And, you know, I've found over the years, if you stick with them and you have a patient enough owner and you can be patient enough, a lot of times they'll come around and that talent will come out. If they show it to you at some point in their career, I don't care if it's the last three-eighths of a nice five-eighths work, you see them zip down there and finish strong, and they have it. If you wait around long enough and you tinker with them enough, you can usually get some good races out of them. Switching gears a little bit, success like that breeds numbers, and I know you've got probably as many, if not more, horses um, than you've probably had in the past. So you've got horses that are in the same categories. You've got horses that are going to run better at one track versus another or on one circuit versus another. And you're in several different locations. How do you manage all that? And in particular, when you're trying to spot horses or place horses, I mean, how do you do it? Do you have other people helping you? Do you have? I, I do all the managing of the condition books and the racing training schedules myself. But I have a great network of people. I have people sitting in the office. and. And there's some good computer programs out there. We work off of one called T-Lore that uh, Tracy Lore has come up with, and it keeps keeps everything organized. If a horse leaves the barn, it comes off at that location. When it arrives at the other location, it goes on there. And the people in the office do it all for me. I couldn't turn, I can barely turn a computer on. If it hadn't been for the iPad, I'd have been in real trouble. But, uh, <laughs> but so it takes a big organization, and I've got great assistants and grooms and exercise people. I mean, my main assistant, Bonamar Behema, he's been with me since I started. I mean, we were 20 years old when we started working together, so 26 years he's been working with me. So he helps a lot. And then I got a lot of other good people have been, just like I said, they've been around forever. They know how I want to do things. Dale, trainers at every level, whether they're claiming trainers on small circuits or the upper echelon Eclipse Award types, all care about their statistics. How much do you care about st your statistics? Do you look at a particular statistic and say, oh, I'm only 8% with first time starters? or I'm only 10% first off the layoff. Do you care about any of that stuff? Is you can meaningful? drive yourself crazy with percentages. I mean, that's, I mean, I do like that statistic money earned, but uh, <laughs> I think that's the, that's the bottom line. Um, but I think whatever is working, I'm not changing it because I'm happy with the way things are going. I'm happy with the way we've been able to develop a lot of good horses. So I'm not gonna get in there and look and say, well, I need to raise my first time starter percentage because even though that may go up, it may have hurt something else somewhere else. Maybe the way we're doing it by not winning the first time helps them develop to be better horses down the road. So I don't too much get into the win percentage or win statistics. And if I did, maybe I don't run Shackleford back in the Florida Derby. Do you, um, you talked about the team. Do you feel, or how important do you feel the jockey is in, in terms of success? Well, I, think there's, I think that there's a lot of good jockeys out there. I think that they all make mistakes in a race. 
I think you're just trying to find the one that makes the mistakes the least, and you get a good chemistry working with somebody, and, and you'll stick together as a team. That's been the best for me. When I, I was very fortunate when I got started that Pat Day was my main jockey, probably the greatest of all time. And, and when you put your name with somebody like him, people respect you, and it really helped me get going. I still talk to him all the time, and, uh, and, and I realize now how great I had it even more than I did when I, back then. And then I got Mark Guidry kind of stuck with me for a long time until he retired the first time. And, and now we're kind of riding Corey a lot, Lannery. And it, uh, I think that getting that team that you like and somebody that's confident, that knows you're not going to fire them if they get one beat or if they make a wrong decision, I think that helps a lot. They're split-second decisions. I don't want somebody sitting at the, on a horse at the head of lane thinking about He told me to stay on the rail. By then, it's too late. Athletes before a big game, they visualize what could possibly happen for them to succeed. Sometimes they can't sleep at night. As a horse trainer, you're not competing yourself in the race, but a horse that you've trained, that you've developed is. Tell us about that feeling the night before a hugely important race in your career and what it's like to have that individual, that young horse that you've developed cross the line first in a very important race. It's a funny story. I've never told anybody about that before, but I could always, I always try to visualize a race like you're talking about. And a lot of times you can't, I can't get it. I can't see it. I can't see it. And usually those horses don't run very well. And so I never tell anybody that, that story before, but and I was, one day Jake, my son, came up to me about three or four years ago, and he says, I always can see the race before, like the night before, and I get to thinking about it, I can visualize what's going on. So I told him about it, and now everybody knows it. But um, I do. I kind of I feel like, especially the big races, you know, almost know every horse. You seem like you know, you've watched them all year. You know who they are. You've seen all the races. You know their forms. You just get a feel for how the race is going to unfold. And uh, when it unfolds just like you expect, sort of like the, the, the last race for Shackleford at Churchill Downs, it's a good feeling. What do you think that people don't know about trainers that would be important or about you as a trainer? I don't know. There's been so much written and said. I don't know that they, <laughs> there's nothing that they don't know. But, uh, you know, training as a whole, the biggest thing is everybody is here because they love horses. I mean, with the New York Times fashion and all that bad stuff to write and it's not even true I mean you could get in there and tear their articles apart and they, they act like the all we're out here is we're, we're money grubbers after the money and they don't care about the animal and it couldn't be further from the truth because there's not enough money involved I mean when an eclipse award I should be able to renegotiate my contract <laughs> but you know it's it, it's not going to happen um, that all the trainers really care I mean the purse structure I don't even know what most race purses are until afterwards at the end of the month I'll look and see how we did I mean of course you know the million dollar ones but <laughs> The main races, allowance races, I don't even know what the purses are. It's just about taking care of your horse and winning races. Dale, you've had a lot of success, and you mentioned earlier uh, potentially second-guessing yourself when things don't go right or maybe a horse gets injured and so on and so forth. Do you ever second-guess yourself when you're campaigning and plotting out a horse's races to say, well, maybe I should have run that horse in a different race or maybe I should have trained that horse a little bit differently? And when that does happen to you, do you in turn learn lessons from that and does that make you a better trainer? Hopefully you learn about all your mistakes that you've made and I think there's no, you know, the experience is the greatest tool that you can have and, it's, and especially in horse racing, it seems like the older you get, the more you learn, the better you are at making decisions. Uh, but I decided early in my career, if there's a tough decision to make, I'm going to make it, I'm going to move on and never think about it again. Um, and I might review and see if I should have done something different, but I'm not going to beat myself up over it. I'm going to know that I made the decision that I thought was right at the time and move on. Because if you start second-guessing yourself too much, then you'll never make the right decision. You'll be worrying too much. You've won Eclipse Award. You've developed top horses. Uh, you've won one of the classic races. I'm sure the, the Derby is, is uh, on the radar as, as the next big goal. That's the biggest goal of any horse trainer's career. I mean, a lot is made of it because I grew up three miles from Churchill Downs, but I don't care if you grew up in Hong Kong. If you're in horse racing in America, you want to win the Kentucky Derby. And uh, so definitely every. All the focus of my barn right now is trying to buy young, good colts that can get us to the Triple Crown. And you're going to come up with a lot of good horses along the way that aren't going to get there. We're fortunate enough to get there the last three years. Been there four times. A uh, couple of times I thought I was going to win even during the race. And one time when Shackleford took the lead at the eighth ball to everybody, I know what it feels like to think you're going to win the Kentucky Derby. He just couldn't hang on that last eighth of a mile. That's the main goal that's left uh, on my resume. And uh, see if it can happen someday. Dale, when you're evaluating your training career and you're looking at it from your perspective as a horse trainer trying to develop horses there's also the aspect of this game which is playing the horses and being a horse player and gambling on the sport we have a lot of people that love the game from that perspective if you were to tell our audience 
how they should go about evaluating a Dale Romans horse, what would be the best advice? Well, I think it's the same as evaluating any horse. I like, I'm still a class player. I like who they've run against, where they've been racing. Uh, I know everybody's turned into figures and stuff. I haven't made that complete conversion yet. I like to look at them, use them for a tool, but I'm more of a class player. I like consistency in racing and consistency in training. If a horse is on a steady pattern, uh, even like looking at the breezes, I wouldn't worry about times at all. You don't know what the trainer's expecting, but I would look for a consistent pattern, especially on young horses or horses coming off layoffs. If you see that every six or seven day breeze, it doesn't really matter what the time was. You know that they're on schedule and they haven't missed a beat and they're probably ready to run. Okay. I think it's great. I, I'm curious though, when you do see something that doesn't pan out, or for instance, you've seen the talent, you mentioned about Shackleford leaving you scratching your head after the Fountain of Youth. I know even this spring, you horse that uh, uh, Dewey was disappointing, didn't show what he you was. knew he could. But do you just draw a line through it and just stick to your guns and go back to the drawing board? Or do you try to adjust something or do something different? I mean, well, how I think do you... the difference in my career now as a trainer than it was when I started 20 years ago, I would have a knee jerk reaction to start changing everything. You know, let's get the blinkers on, let's do this, let's do that. And, and a lot of times I think in doing that, you might overlook what the true problem is. You, you start throwing the remedies at, you know, every horse by the end of the career seems to be wearing blinkers. It doesn't matter if they get beat, they, automatically they need, the jock says, let's put blinkers on them. But now I've learned to just kind of study yourself, evaluate your horse, and realize that a lot of times they run bad and you won't explain it. And you better have confidence in your horse and keep moving forward. It's all about keeping uh, a straight path and moving forward and not looking behind. And that's in everything you do. It doesn't matter what you do. Don't don't worry about what happened behind you. Don't worry about what you're going to do ahead of you. Well, fantastic interview, Kate. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Because uh... I just think, judging by the reaction at the Eclipse Awards, which was by far and away the biggest uh, ovation of the evening, if uh, if and when you get that uh, Derby win, I, I can't imagine how popular it's going to be around Louisville and in the racing industry. It would be a lot of fun. You know, the closest thing was Shackleford when he won that close the night at Churchill. Uh, yeah, that was probably one of the highlights of my career. That whole grandstand was shaking. Everybody started cheering for him when he hit the quarter pole. The place had 30,000 people in it, and everybody really appreciated what he had done. And uh, to win the Derby would be pretty special. But that, the other night at the Eclipse Awards was, almost, was overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, it was a special night, one I'll never forget, or my family. Everything really is pins on what that horse is telling me. So, and so some of them are, tell you early. Some of them tell you a lot later on. Some of them sort of look like they're going to be okay on the dirt and then t sort of don't really keep up with you know, better class stable mates and switch, a switch in surface elevates them or doesn't change them. You know, all, the best index that you have are the other horses in your barn. So hopefully you've got some better players that you can measure, use that measuring stick with. But in general, you can kind of get an idea of a horse as they progress along. But as I said, some of them will go all the way up to a five-eighths, even a six furlong work with a big gallop out, and then, you know, they'll change your mind, like I did with draw two. I changed my mind on the last work. I had an idea that I wanted to switch him to the grass anyway, but by the time we were coming along into his later stages of his training, he was, he was starting to sort of tell me that he was okay at this, but he was really good at something else. Most favorite is always has always been and still is being able to ride in the mornings. Every morning, it's a brilliant concept in anybody's life to be able to be on your favorite horse first thing in the morning and have a a day where you can just be anywhere. Racetrack is where we have to be, but it, they you know the horses that really enjoy this job love training, love being out there. It's the it's. So when you can work with a coworker who loves his job and you like your job, it's like the best thing in the world. And um, you know, I try not to think about the things that are my least favorite, so I really don't focus on that part. But there's um, there's a, there's probably more than one least favorite thing. Most of it has to do with being on the phone. <laughs> so that's that's probably my least favorite. Well, my favorite part of the job is obviously every morning looking at those, you know, beautiful animals and uh, being around, you know, being blessed to be around those type of 
creatures, and uh, that's the favorite part. The, those, the worst part of it is doing it every day. That's the worst part of it. But on the other hand, uh, that's the job we chose. That's the life we chose. So, you know, you can't ask for anything more. You got to be grateful. That's a good question. I guess I'd like to think that every time I walk over, I've got something that's live. It's, that's obviously not always true for different reasons, but in general, we try to make sure we're competitive every time we walk over. I think when we put a horse in a very competitive spot and it looks like it might be overmatched, chances are that's a very good horse to bet because we're not going to do that to a horse that mentally isn't prepared for that, physically isn't prepared. And if, if he doesn't get it done, you know, it's... It's a function of probably some, one of many other factors, but not those two. Well, for me, you know, if anyone's followed our career, we always look for a horse that's going to go a distance of ground. I mean, if they can't do that, then you can't think about any triple crown races. There's no way. They have to be able to, to do that. So for us, the first thing we look at is, you know, the balance of a horse, how they look, of course, who they're by, you know, how they're bred, and, you know, what their demeanor is, because we always look for one to get better, and uh, that's what we want. We want to just keep getting better. Truly, I think a lot of the jocks will tell you that it doesn't matter who rides a great horse. They're going to get it done. The, the time that you need to select your jock very carefully is when you have a horse that's hairline maybe below the rest of the field or right in the rest of the field and you really need somebody who fits that horse perfectly. And then after that it's about communication with that person. And so a lot of these riders are very talented, many, many, many of them. I think that the one thing that sort of changes the element of what's happening in your, in, with a jockey and a trainer is communication. And so. I'll pick somebody who trusts me and believes what I'm saying. And if I say, this horse is live today, warm him up away from the pony, trust me. <laughs> you can take him away from the pony because I'm not going to get you dropped. This is, not a, this, this is probably a horse I ride every day. So I will not put you on a bad horse. You know, I, I've been asked that question from the day I started training. And I... <laughs> And I know a lot of the trainers that don't ride, you know, kind of bristle at that. And I understand why, because at the same time, I'll bristle at people who tell me that, you know, I have a significant advantage over the, those guys. And it's not true. I think every individual trainer is just as much um, benefited by what they've learned to do. So guys that don't ride are excellent at evaluating from the ground and can evaluate many, many horses. And I, because I love riding, and I want to make that still a big part of my life. It sort of, you know, keeps me kind of closer to the horse, but it also moderates how many horses that I am able to evaluate at one time. So, you know, it's just my style and it, and it benefits me because it happens to be something that I enjoy and have become very, very familiar with. So I have to have r riders and other jocks that, that I can get information from to evaluate what they're saying. And it, and it doesn't necessarily make me better or worse than anybody else. It's just an individual style. Well, I think for sure, there's no question uh, it's more competitive. Everybody wants to do it. Uh, the owners, I would say, and I'm not trying to be a jerk about this, but I think 20 years ago, uh, a trainer named Baffert came along uh, Lucas had been there, and I think we were second, and we had tried to recruit horses at the sales with the idea of always going to the Triple Crown, the Derby, the Premium. And now I think everybody's doing it. When I say everybody, uh, I think the majority of the owners today have that, not all of them, obviously, but a lot more. So the competition, in my opinion, is much steeper, much greater. I think the trainers, uh, you know, obviously they're, they're younger and they're coming up and the owners are just as competitive as can be. And I think there's more competitive owners today than ever before. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, when we first came around, you know, you had a bookkeeper, you had this, you had that. But today it's just managerial. Most owners today have somebody doing it. 
Uh, the ones uh, today that have quite a few horses have multiple trainers and they have racing managers in a situation where uh, you're dealing with a lot of that today. And what it is is they want somebody to look after their business and, you know, keep an eye on things. But, you know, years ago it was just kind of the trainer and the owner. But then when you, you branch out and you get a lot of horses, it's hard. So that's why they have managers and that's why they have racing consultants and whatever. But for me, you know, uh, I'm blessed. You know, I still have Mary Lou Whitney. They do it the old fashioned way. And uh, sometimes that works, you know. So hopefully um, that's still good, you know. But I'm very blessed with all the owners I have and uh, I've had a lot of good relationships. With, uh, and I've, I've worked for most of my owners for a long time. So. But the things has changed now. I mean, it's changed. I mean, you can't blame them. They have to have somebody watching their business. They have to have somebody keep an eye on everything for them. And let's face it, it's a lot of money. And uh, I've been fortunate. I've had a lot of great owners that take me to the sale. I'm grateful, you know, and, uh, and I've had some great winners. You know, I've done a lot of things with that. And, uh, you know, I'm blessed. Well, that's really interesting because the owners, I think, take a very good look at that now, statistic-wise, you know. And I'm the type of trainer, believe it or not, like, uh, I could come off the bench and, you know, and if the bases are loaded and they want me to pitch hit, I'm, I'm liable to get that hit. But on the other hand, you got to do it constantly. So what I'm referring to is I've stopped a few Triple Crown bids in my career you know with some long shots but yet the percentages you know you're not going to do that if you're worried about your percentage you can't do that you can't beat uh, Smarty Jones if you're worried about your percentage you can't beat Big Brown if you're worried about your percentage however uh, it's part of racing and you can't blame the owner if he looks at a Nick Zito and his percentage isn't that high and somebody else is you know that's the way it is it's changed the business has changed uh, you're right about percentages, but on the other hand, you know, it goes, th there's another way of looking at it. And for people out there that want to understand that, if a trainer is worried about his percentage, he ain't, there's a chance he may not win a, a big race. You know, it's not always going to go to Todd Pletcher or Billy Mott or whoever I'm leaving out. So uh, on the other hand, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. We're happy. Originally, the only connection that I had with horses is my dad loved them. So we went to the races. We went to Saratoga. We went to Belmont. We went to Aqueduct. We went to... We, the kids couldn't at the time get into Roosevelt and Yonkers. So it was... Um, we were unable to get to the standard bread. So we are... My only background was thoroughbreds. When I moved to Long Island from Brooklyn, my mother suggested riding lessons. So uh, that was actually my first hands-on experience with horses. I... I took riding lessons, and then, then as I went to college, uh, I, it segued into the standard rides. I was um, riding hunters and jumpers and going to college, and a friend of mine worked at the racetrack, and she suggested that instead of going to work for a ve veterinarian, I would go down to Roosevelt Raceway and get a summer's worth of experience there, and once I did that, um, I really fell in love with the standard bread, and I never left. When I first started in the standard breads, a caretaker was responsible for two horses. Um, now it's run a lot more like the thoroughbreds. A caretaker may run up to take care of up to four or five horses. We have more trainers. When I first started, I was responsible for almost exclusively the care and training of those two horses. Uh, the, sta the trainer would mark the board every day, but I would be responsible for jogging and exercising my horses. Nowadays, uh, the, the caretakers are pretty much in the stalls with the horses all the time, and uh, the trainers train the horses. So that part's changed. Um, the horse 
himself has evolved into a much prettier horse now uh, than they used to be. They used to call the standard birds jugheads. Um, they were ugly. You know, they had Roman noses. They were big. They were kind of looking at somewhere between a, a draft horse and a Morgan. And they don't look that way at all anymore. They're beautiful horses with a beautiful head and, and a nice little ear on them. And I think that as the speed comes in this sport, and I think as our breed is becoming more and more defined, I think the horses are getting prettier. The, the bones are getting longer and more finer. And the, and the breed is getting much faster. So that part has changed also. The other thing is when I first came into the business, uh, a trainer would a lot of the times drive their own horses. Now uh, with the evolution of the catch driver, that also has to do with some of the speed. Uh, the catch drivers primarily um, just do that. There's a few that still have uh, stables to fall back on, but for the most part, um, they, it, trainers train and drivers drive. Well, I don't think that a horse, they can do it, but I don't think that a horse needs those two and three trips that every week that they used to get. You know, it was not uncommon to see a horse go three trips between races now. And I think it's pretty unusual to see a horse go three trips at all, ever, even training down right now. So you, you have to kind of adapt to the speed. Um, you have to give them a little bit more time between races right now. I think, again, more like a thoroughbred type situation. Um, it's it's unusual for a horse, to, a stake horse, to go week after week after week. It's better to give them a little bit more time to recover in between. I like to think I have a good relationship with my owners because I always constantly remind myself that, that my business is their hobby and that they don't make this isn't their primary source of income so if they stop having fun doing this then it's probably something they can eliminate from their lives so uh, so I think that an owner needs to be kept aware of what's going on and I think that a uh, honesty is first and foremost I, I, I think I'm I'm probably honest to a fault but I, I think it's really important that they know going in what their horse's problems are or what their horse's uh, strengths are and what to expect. Um, I also try to make it a, a point to touch base with them and, and let them know, you know, what their horse is up to, when they're going to qualify, if they're into race. Um, and then we try to talk after the races also. Uh, it's important, I think. It definitely varies from owner to owner as far as how much contact. Uh, obviously, a guy that owns five or six or ten horses in my barn gets more uh, information from me than somebody that that might own one. Also, there are owners that enjoy being hands-on, and those kind of uh, owners need more information than the ones that just kind of, there are there are many owners that I deal with, they really don't want to be bothered. I mean, some of the top owners in the sport say don't even bother calling me until they're ready to qualify, because they understand that, that a horse can break your heart and that training them down doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's when they get to the races that they need. Oh, two two part questions. My uh, I guess the the first thing when it comes to developing a young horse is the selection of a young horse. Sometimes you ha you get that opportunity to select. Sometimes people send them to you. Uh, so when you you, you kind of go to a sale and you look at their pedigrees and you see them out in the field and you look at their confirmation and if everything works out, then you have hope that you have enough money to purchase them. Um, uh, that is probably one of my strengths is that I, I think I'm able to get to the sales and maybe find that mid-range yearling that um, somebody else might overlook. Uh, I like to bring them along kind of slow. I like to let them find their own way, always keeping in mind when the money starts and, and letting a horse come, but never pushing them because I find that if you push them, then it never works. It, it, one, actually, Richard Gutnick says if, if you don't wait on the horse, the horse will make you wait on him. And he's 100% right because over and over and over again I've pressed and I've tried to get them there a little bit quicker and it doesn't work. So I've learned. You learn from your mistakes. You let a horse come at his own pace. And uh, they only have one two-year-old year. They only have one three-year-old year. The three-year-old year is really important. So you try to bring them along. You try to assess their ability and find out what kind of horse there is. they are as a two-year-old and then, you know, kind of set them on course so that you know what they're doing. As far as when, whether or not they let you know what kind of a horse they are, 
no in this day and age they you know which ones you don't like you know I tell that to owners all the time I can pretty much tell you the ones that I don't like as far as the ones I do like they can fool you um, all you have to hope is that they get say healthy that they're good gated that they like their work and then when you get them to the races that they are good horses. I mean, I'd be a liar to say that um, I knew training them down every single one of them. I can tell you that I like them. I can tell you that they've they've not encountered many problems. And then I have to hope that when they get to the races, market share is classic case in point. Um, market share didn't do anything wrong. He got a little bit sore in his knees as a two-year-old, and we had to shut him down for a month or so. Uh, credit to his owner. And then when we brought him back, he was a really nice freehold horse. Jeff Gregory did an incredible job of of schooling him and educating him and teaching him to get there first and uh, when I brought him back as a three-year-old I hoped you know he came into it um, as a horse that was somewhat regarded but certainly not anything that looked like the kind of horse that he's developed into and even more so now at four than he was at three he's gotten consistent he's gotten stronger he's able to carry his uh, his speed right to the end of the mile this year definitely um, First of all, the page is what gets you to the stall. So you start looking at the pedigree pages and you see what you like as far as pedigree pages. Uh, in some, I like two-year-old speed. I think two-year-old speed carries through. When I'm looking for an inexpensive yearling, I think that if I see two-year-old speed on the on the page that I might be able to get one a little bit cheaper. Pedigree is is gotten so important these days because to go the speeds that we need to go against the horses we do it's the uh, it's the pedigree that carries you through and then once you get them out of the stall you have to like first second you see them you have to like them if you don't like them you're only fooling yourself put them back in the stall um, I like a horse with a nice head I like a horse um, and then you start taken apart from there. I like I like a horse that's kind of symmetrical. I like when they're balanced and and it's we all have different tastes. I don't necessarily care as far as um as far as colors are concerned. I like a strong color though. I like a a dark brown horse to be strong in color. I don't like a wishy-washy bay. You know, there's little things that we all have. They're not necessarily right they're, or wrong. They're just my taste. And um I also like to get to the farms because I think that examining them at the sales ring is one thing, but seeing them in their own environment before they've been poked and prodded is very, very important also. The minute they walk out of the stall, I have to like them. You'd think that'd be a tough question, but I've been saying it my whole life and I was taught by uh, one of my mentors that the difference between a good trainer and an average trainer is really one thing, and that's common sense. Um, it, you have to be a horse person, but when push comes to shove, when things are going wrong, just step back and use common sense. If they don't act good, they probably won't race good. If they don't look good, they probably don't feel good. Um, if they're happy in their routine and they're eating and they're cheerful, they're probably going to give you their best on the racetrack. So when I get stuck, and we all do, but when I get stuck, I try to take a step back and just use common sense. Probably not as important as you'd think. I like to think that my percentage of getting them to the races is probably as important to me. I like to know that I, the horses that I select get there because that's going to basically guarantee me job security. Um, then you want to see them race well. But, you know, horses can race incredibly well and get beat. And I, I think that as long as they show up and they give you their best efforts on the racetrack, um, the win percentage is nice, but it means that you're doing it a job and you're doing it consistently and I think that's the key to being at the top of your game is not necessarily to have a good year but to have a good career. These days the I deal with mostly young horses so it's a little bit different when you're doing the raceway horses but as far as the uh, young horses are concerned, if I'm bringing one along that I think has a lot of ability but may not be ready to throw them to the wolves, I'm a big believer that a horse should learn to win. So if I can start a horse off in a lesser class and teach him to win, I'm going to do that. 
any time I get the opportunity to because I think that if you start a horse's career off by chasing and chasing and they get frustrated and people don't think that horses do get frustrated but they do they do and if they learn to lose they don't they don't learn to win so I prefer to start them off a little bit on a, a lower level and let them teach them to win and give them a career as far as when I'm bringing back an older horse if I start them a little bit lower and I think that they've earned a chance up, then you give it to them. If it doesn't work, they have to go back down again. Same with the young horses. And the same plays in, in reverse. If I start them up and I see that they're giving me everything they have and they're just not getting there and I know they're healthy and I know they're sound and I think they're just reaching a little bit too hard sometimes that drop in class can make all the difference in the world because they can get a little bit of confidence if they figure out what they're supposed to be doing and learn to win uh, I've seen horses that have changed just in the blink of an eye when you able to put them on the lead see the other part of it is with the catch drivers I'm not going to say they drive the board but they may look and a horse at 25 to 1 is not going to get the same type of drive that they might um, at 3 to 5 so if I can drop a horse and I, that I think belongs on the front end if I can give him a lesser put him in a lesser class and then race him the way he wants to race and he wins the horse gets confidence the driver gets confidence in the horse and, um, and we kind of change the path that we were headed on that year I've been very fortunate recently to use Timmy. He, he pretty much fits any kind of horse. Um, but if I were to have a lazy horse, there are aggressive drivers. If you have a horse that's very high strung and and uh, needs to be calmed down, you certainly wouldn't want to put that same aggressive driver on that horse. And uh, when you do have a match, there are some drivers that get along so well with other with some horses. They, they instinctively know where they need to be in the mile. and and whether they need to chase them or whether they don't like the whip or whether they they need to be on the lead and yeah I try very hard to match the driver and the horse if possible um, when you get to the level that we're racing and you're able to get a guy like Timmy or Pierce or or any of the top guys right now um, Andy Miller David Miller I, I could go right down John Campbell I mean it, these guys they can drive anything you know they they're able to adapt themselves because they have incredible amount of experience and they're part horse so but if I out of out of town probably it becomes more important to me that I wouldn't want to put a very aggressive driver on a very high strung filly and I wouldn't want to put a very unaggressive driver on a filly that or a horse that needs somebody to wake them up It is valuable because just like we were saying before about how we train them differently these days, you know, when when they're going week to week, we're obviously not going as fast as they would be going um, in a race. So a driver that's able to say to me that it was running in a little bit or it was cross firing or it didn't think it was trotting as good as it could be, um, it's going to help me set them up so that next time they're going to be uh, better gated on the racetrack and, and more user friendly. Okay, I would say that the biggest difference between training a trotter and a pacer is uh, is patience. You need to be very patient with a trotter. You need to know that sometimes you just have to back off. Um, it's, a, it's a game of trial and error. I used to be very intimidated by training a trotter because I used to think that, oh my goodness, it's not trotting. And then I realized that if I take the time and I, and I play with it and I change the shoes a little bit here and I give them a little bit more time and all of a sudden they'll start to come. Well, I'm much more comfortable when I first started in the young horses because my background was pacers so um, I was much more comfortable training a pacer because I, I get that gait so I could make equipment changes and that would immediately fix it with a trotter sometimes immediate is not is not a word that can be used it's just it, they evolve but having said that 
it's probably easier to tell training down a trotter whether or not he's good or not. I think just the fact that we're dealing with a natural gait, if they get over the ground real easy and they don't work real hard at it, there's a good chance that, that they're going to tell you easier than a pacer. These days, pacers go so fast. It's almost impossible. If I, I could have a, a pacer that could pace in 52 and it might not even be good enough to be a top stake horse. And uh, yet on the other hand, if you have a trotter that's going to stay at it, not make breaks, he's going to find a place to make money. There's no possible way I could put into words what it was like to win the Hamiltonian. You spend um, your life watching the television coverage or going to the races and seeing people compete in this race and you say to yourself just once I'd like to compete in it. Never ever letting your brain get there to think that you could possibly win it. Uh, in order for that to happen all the stars have to come into alignment and everything has to work out for you. But the hoopla uh, it, it, it's it's kind of synonymous to the Oscars or or to the uh, World Series or the Stanley Cup. You know when you get to that level and you see that the people show up and and from the international appeal. Ronnie Pierce said to me after the race last year, um, people are going to be coming up to you six months from now and congratulating you on this race. He said it's it's going to be life changing for you, and he absolutely was a hundred percent right because no matter where I've gone people have actually come up and, and spoke to me about it and it's um, it, it was a dream come true. Fortunately for me, it is, of course it is, but fortunately for me the, the nerve-wracking week was the year before. I really thought I had a chance with Chapter 7. I really, really believed that this was a quality animal and if things went right that there was a chance that, um, that he could win it. With market share I was bound and determined I was going to enjoy the experience. I had been through it once. I, I knew that the press was going to be around and I knew that there was going to be a lot of pressure. And uh, with market share, I, I said, this time I'm going to have fun with it. And I think we did. I think we really enjoyed it. I think we welcomed everybody into the barn. And uh, I think the horse had a great week going into it. And I think Timmy and I spoke about it and said, look, we may never get this opportunity again. I may never get this opportunity again. I know he will. Um, but uh, swing for the fence. And uh, everything just worked out. My family was able to be there. Um, it was just one of them dream Cinderella days. Looking for a fun and easy way to learn more about horse racing? Night School, Tuesday nights. Enjoy access to top racing insiders via chat, video, and radio. Night School caters to fans at all levels. Miss a class? Read the archive. Night School, Tuesday nights. See you then.